All righty. I'm really, really excited about this. I just, uh, I, I see it all the time. I, I see posts on our Facebook groups uh, looking for an accountant, looking for a, a tax strategist. And uh, in full disclosure, uh, Cindy Dillard is my personal accountant. Well, I should say my personal, her entire team. And this is, this is part of the advantage of uh, Cindy's company. She's got an entire team of tax strategists and assistants that really get things done. And I'm telling you, if you have investors or you are investing in real estate or you are producing in real estate, having the right tax strategist is paramount. Um, it's not always who is the cheapest. It's who is going to save you the most and give you uh, the greatest strategy. So, Cindy, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. So good to have you. Thank you. I appreciate being here. All right. So uh, let's uh, jump into it. Um, I didn't really get a, a big chance to take a look at everything that you got on your slides. Um, so I, so it's going to be a surprise for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I did see one of them, and I, um, this is probably the number one question we get from real estate agents, is uh, when do I or when should I consider setting up a PLLC or a PC and let's maybe backtrack and go into what that is specifically. What are some of the benefits of it, and when? At what at what income level, as far as commissions go, mm -hmm. at what income level does an agent need to go? Okay, I need to start thinking about getting a PLLC set up. You bet. So, the income level is at about fifty thousand. Fifty thousand is when it can make a difference in how we file your taxes. Typically, up to fifty thousand. It just is what it is, and you're going to file as a sole proprietor. This is why I'm not an accountant. I've been telling everybody it's about 35, so i got to make some phone calls after this. <laughs> well, 50000 covers, it would be that amount that would cover a fee to get you to an S-Corp or if we were going to change how we were going to file you. Um, part of the problem is with most real estate agents is they don't realize it needs to be a PLLC. So I don't know if it's the Board of Realtors or who it is that they talk to, but oftentimes I have a client that will – they listen to a seminar and then they go set up Homes by Cindy, LLC. Okay, that doesn't cut it with the That's right. as a real estate agent. You've got to be a PLLC, and a PLLC is your name. It's Cindy Dillard PLLC. That's something I want to be really clear about. And yes, you need to get a tax ID number. That tax ID number allows us to file a separate tax return. And the more you can separate your personal and your business taxes, the better off you're going to be down the road. And what I do with our clients is we just go through a list, a checklist. These are the things that I want you to run through your business bank account. Um, you've probably heard it. They don't want to. They don't want you to um, pierce the corporate veil. That's when you commingle your funds. Um, I tend to, you know, I get clients all the time that are they, they get scared about that, and and here I am, a tax professional, and I get to the the register and I don't know which credit card to use and I use the wrong one and then I have to have my bookkeeper change it. So also realize the IRS realizes we're human beings. There's still going to be things, but for the most part, they want you to run business expenses. That's, hold on. That's business. one of the nicest things I've heard anyone ever say about the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess you're not playing as well as Cindy is. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> they don't like me over there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Cindy. Go ahead. That's okay. So, yes, be very clear and very intentional about what you're running through the business and what you're not running through the business. Dry clean is not deductible. Um, don't pay your mortgage out of your business account. That's a personal expense. Um, I teach our clients how to how to claim your home office and how to pay your kids and how to do all that. Um, so that we can stay within the li guidelines of what is legally deduct tax deductible. All right. So, and I, and I think one of the things also I want to be clear, you, you did mention that your PLLC has to be your name. So I recommend just going by the name that's on your real estate license. Yes. And then from our side of things here at West USA or at your brokerage, then you have to submit that to the Department of Real Estate. The Department of Real Estate has to accept that and say, okay, you are now, um, you know, Cindy Dillard PLLC. 
don't put that on your business cards. Don't put that on your yard signs. Right. But then once you get the acceptance from the Department of Real Estate, then that goes to your broker or your brokerage. And then from there, the brokerage now can pay. The check can be made payable to your PLLC rather than you. Actually, the broker has to sign the PLLC form that you will submit to get your license. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. See, that's even stuff I didn't know, but I knew there was some form of... Just one more piece. All right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And then from there, you just get an EIN number, mm-hmm. and then you go down and have, open up a checking account. You're mm-hmm. going to have to have an EIN number. You may or may not, depending on your bank, have to have some sort of articles of organization. Um, and then once you have that, then your brokerage now cuts the check to your PLLC. That check goes into your PLLC, and then your PLLC is now paying expenses and then yes. paying you as an individual. Yes. How does that yes. work? So in the beginning, as you're getting the transition, depending on when it is that time of year, so that's a really good question that we get. Well, how do I pay myself? You're going to take the money that you're going to live, that you need to live on, that you've typically lived on, and do it as a distribution or an owner's draw. Then at the point that we need to have you on a W-2, so I think you guys have probably heard the IRS says, you know, any S-Corp, they want to see a payroll to the owner. Well, they want to see a payroll to the owner once you're a certain profit. So if our profit is 50000 so, okay, so let's back up. I need you to be a PLLC when your income is 50000 The IRS wants to see a W-2 from your PLLC to you when your profit is at 50000 mm right? And then what they talk about is what's a reasonable wage for yourself. And so typically it runs 50-50, 60-40. So if I'm a $100,000 profit, I want to see a W-2 for at least $50,000 or $60,000 to yourself from your PLLC. Even though your PLLC is your name, from your PLLC to your personal name, a W-2. All right. So again, I haven't seen the slides yet. So if you have it in a further slide, then we'll wait till we get there. But um, I remember you came to our team meeting like three or four years ago, and you st- started talking about this pay your kids thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm going, that's BS. I like, there's no way <laughs> that this right. crazy lady is right. <laughs> and then I went back and I started researching it. I'm like, holy crap. One of the the best tools out there. So is that in a, a, a future slide? Yeah. Well, some it's under the missed deductions okay, that I then, see. Then we'll get there. So yeah. now I, I I have a cliffhanger out there for everybody. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, specific tax deductions. And these would come out of the PLLC business bank account. Anything professional development, your license fees and association fees, your marketing and advertising, any technology expenses. Okay. So realize. The IRS doesn't, they haven't updated their tax forms to say, oh, Google AdWords or apps. There's no category for any apps that I have on my phone that Mm -hmm. I'm using for business, right? So you've got to think about where can I put this deduction that doesn't have a specific category. And I get that all the time. I, I get clients say, well, I was trying to get my documents to you, but I just have no idea what category to put these things in. I'm limited, every tax professional is limited on your categories. So you have to think about it. Are they going to follow under marketing or advertising? Are they going to file under legal and professional? See, your professional development and license and association fees are probably going to file under legal and professional. So don't get hung up on the category. Think about it and think about what am I doing and where can I put this that would apply to what the IRS can recognize, right? Right. Yeah, and that's why um, that's why I like a lot with with my taxes. Um, just a lot of it just gets thrown under marketing and advertising mm-hmm. because there's so many different varieties. And and when I take clients golfing, or mm-hmm. I take them out to d- you know dinner, or I do a housewarming party, it's it's advertising because it's marketing and advertising because it's really what I'm doing. Business. Trying yes. to get more business. Yes. All right. Good stuff. All right. So m- most missed tax. Deductions, yeah, that they're, yeah. That's yeah, this is this is on every tax return. If I if I look at a tax return, and I can see I can see if you've done the Augusta rule or paying your kids. So let's talk about those. So, the Augusta rule. The IRS said that if you rent your home out for 14 days or less in a year, you don't have to claim the income. So, I want to see on every tax return your business, your PLLC, 
pay you for rent. Yes, you're going to sign a lease agreement, and I want to see the money transfer or a check written. I always say a check written. They're like, well, we don't have checks. Mm -hmm. Okay, transfer still works, but then you categorize that as rent. So think about we just had this, um, the Super Bowl here a year ago. Every one of my clients should have had the Augusta roll on theirs that they rented the week during the Super Bowl, right? That's when the rents were the highest. Now, you are going to do fair market rents in your area. What is it for 14 days in that area? But you're also going to look to see when can I do this at its most expensive time of the year, right? Um, paying your kids. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the IRS said you can pay your kids $13,900 tax for a year. Uh, so that went up. It used to it be did. 12. So it, went, was, it was 12.5. And every year it goes up. So last year for 23, it was 13.9. Yes, they want to see the checks written to the children, the money going to their account. I have my kids take a, keep a time card so that we can just support. Now, what's been really fun is I have some clients that have seven-year-olds, so it's in the seven-year-old's writing, and they keep this time card. <laughs> they emptied out the company trash, and they cleaned out the company car now. So the IRS says your age is, their kids age seven to 17. Now, I have a real estate agent. Her kids are little, but she did open house, and she invited other moms of kids their age. Well, I would still use that. They're not seven, but she actually used the kids in their advertising. They're in all the pictures, right? That's the biggest one, pay your kids. Um, business use of the home, that's another one. I see so many times it's, it's, I work from home, but I also have an office. How do I do that? And you just, you can let me do that. We can do it monthly, either reimburse yourself for business use of the home or you can do it at the end of the year. And I like to see those checks written or cut rather than just do a journal entry. So a journal entry would be, I really didn't do it. I paid everything personally, but I still want to take the deduction. That's a journal entry. Um, buying or leasing a vehicle. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so it's a big one. Which one is better? I have my clients keep track of everything. Then I can decide at tax time. Now, so let's say I'm a real estate agent. All of a sudden, I have just a phenomenal year. I have that million-dollar buyer that just sent me over the top of what I had been planning for. Well, but she also was going to buy a vehicle. So buying, when I have a big year, if I have a big car that's over 6,000 pounds, is going to be better than if I lease it. Now, if I'm in a retirement community and I only sell to my retirement, I'm never going to have you buy that car. I'm going to have you lease it because that's a better deduction for what I'm going to take in the year if I'm on my fixed mileage, right? So you have to look at both to see what matters. And yes, I want you to keep track of everything. Some of the things people miss are, well, they pay $29 for that car wash every month. I miss that. Um, their insurance. They finance the car, so it'd be the interest on that car. Everything to do with that vehicle is now a potential deduction. And as soon as I see a client owes and I see their auto is like $150, it's like, okay, well, we need to talk about that, especially as a real estate agent in Arizona. You know, I'm from Idaho. You wouldn't drive 30 miles to do anything. Here we drive it <laughs> three times a day, right? Um, so that one's always a big one. And then travel. So the IRS said... Travel for business and then make it a vacation. What do I have to do to do that? How many hours do I have to work on Friday and on Monday to make that whole weekend deductible? What do I have to do if I want to take a whole week off? And how do I deduct that? What, what are my requirements by the IRS that I have to do to be able to do that? You know, Tom Wilwright, he's my mentor. And he said, the question isn't, is it deductible? The question is, how do I make it deductible? Yeah. What do I have to do that? So... If you're a lazy real estate agent and you don't want to deduct it, that's fine. I don't care. But is it worth putting in a little bit extra, little bit extra work, sending a few extra emails to go on that vacation, conduct some business to be able to write it off? I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, and really quick, when I did, one thing I didn't put on here, the IRS talks about they want you to buy a property in a place you like to visit. Even if I have a property manager at the cabin that I purchased in Idaho... They're going to let me go to Idaho and keep checking on that as much as I want through the year. Well, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> I get to go home, right? I get to see my mom, and I'm going to check on all my properties. So that's just another tidbit. Now, I'm, I'm afraid to ask too many questions or 
provide any examples in case I get audited and this is this is recorded. Yes. <laughs> so I'm not saying what I've done or what I haven't right. done. So uh, a friend of yours did something, yeah. right? I'm asking for a friend. I'm asking for a friend. So um, so I do. I, I, there is not a trip, a vacation or whatever. There's not a trip that I go on that I legitimately am not working. So I don't have any issues with that. However, I'm also through, and, and I do everything through my, my business credit card, Rack Miles, and then I have my PLLC, you know, pay that off and everything like that. But on this business trip, sometimes I'm taking my family and I'm buying them airline tickets. And then I might be doing my, my personal shopping. I mean, I get all my, mm-hmm. all my clothes when I'm on a business mm-hmm. trip. And my, is, is buying tickets for the rest of my family, are those expenses deductible? Or is it just me? So initially, it's just you unless we're paying the kids and we're having our family work with us in the business, right? Mm. So sometimes when I get those numbers, and I tell you to keep track of all of us. So this is a great situation where I want you to keep track of everything. You took your family on this trip. I want the PLLC to pay for it. I might not take it all 100%. Okay, gotcha. But you, that gives me the ability to go in and see how much. Just like cell phones or internet. Okay, we have the family plan. Are we going to take everybody on that? Am I going to take that whole amount on that phone bill? No, I typically don't. Now, if I if I get the phone bill and it's like 230 bucks, chances are you're not giving me the whole phone bill, right? Because we don't have home phones anymore. Everybody's on a cell phone. So I'm going to ask for the whole phone bill so I can take the percentage then. So I want you to give me everything. That gives me more leverage for your tax return if I have everything. Then I can go in and I can adjust it. All right. Good. I think I'm on the, Well, first of all, I mean, I say that, but you know, there's nothing I do without conferring with you. Right. So, right. <laughs> yep. All right, the do's and don'ts, some do's and don'ts. Okay, track your income expenses. Now, for real estate agents, it's you get a 1099, so I'm, we're not going to have an issue. Now, the year that you switch to a PLLC, and if you're being taxed as an S Corp, you're not going to get a 1099. You have to claim all your income. I get this every day, and I just had somebody, I just got the numbers, and they said, yep, that's it. That's all the 1099s I got. Okay, I don't want to know the 1099s. I want to know all your income. Keep track of your income. I don't care what your 1099 says. Let's make sure at least they're close. If not, make sure you've claimed everything. Track your auto expenses. So everything's generated from your miles. What are the miles? And mile IQ it's a really good tracker. It'll If I put down that I've gone to the office and it's for business, every time I go to the office, it'll track it for business. So it's a really great tool to use. Um, the don'ts, disregard tax planning. So I've changed the model of my, of my business because I had too many people not reaching out and doing tax planning. So the beauty is right now with this being tax season, it's an easy tax season because... I did planning for almost 90% of my clients last year. And I tell them, we're not talking during tax season unless I get in there and I'm doing your return and it doesn't match the tax planning. Something happened. You either closed a deal and you forgot to tell me. Something happened. And then the other thing I see is um, I have a lot of realtors that their husbands have a handyman business or construction business, and then they 1099 their spouse. Okay, don't ever 1099 your spouse. If you have other businesses and you have partnerships, don't 1099 yourself. Let me just keep saying that. Do not 1099 yourself or your spouse. It just creates this mess inside your tax return of the other income. Want me to just move on this one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to Tom Wilwright. So he's been my mentor for, gosh, 20 years, and... He teaches in this book how to turn your rental property into a business and how do I make those things tax deductible. All right. And so I, you know, so this will just be a good segue, Um, you know, especially as I said from the very beginning, if you are working with investors or you are a real estate agent wanting to invest in real estate, definitely highly recommend this book. There are there are so many, I've, and I've had my share of accountants over the years. I've just, I've never been able to take advantage 
And that's the thing you always talk, you always teach us, Cindy. It's you know the IRS aren't the bad guys. We shouldn't mm -hmm. get stressed out about the IRS. Mm -hmm. They've provided paths for us to be able to keep more of our money. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Tom Wilwright is a big proponent of that. He says they want to be your friend. They want to be in business with you. So how to tr how to make it a business? So you create a holding company. A holding company is an LLC and it's member managed. So that's a key, and I do want you to talk to your attorney about this and have them help you set it up. But then each property you own is going to hold its own LLC. The member is going to be your holding company, and you are going to be your manager. You or your spouse are going to be your manager. That means I can be on the checking accounts. Now, what this does is this provides it. If I have three rental properties, I only have to have one business checking account. I don't have to have three. So I have a client. He has 28 properties, and he has a checking account for 28 properties. And that's just almost a nightmare to navigate through because let's say he buys something. Like, what would it be? I'm, mm, something that can go landscape. between properties. Yes. <laughs> and it's the same landscaper for each. Mm -hmm. But he knows that if he buys this turf for this one, it can be for three more, right? Something like that. So that might be a holding company expense and not directly to each property. Gotcha. So, but this is, this is for your asset protection, but also tax returns. So I'd file the holding company as a partnership, and then each of your properties go under there. Just like on your personal return, it's filed on a Schedule E, which is rental property. It's the same thing here. So in this holding company, it's a partnership, and then it gets filed on what looks just like a Schedule E. So, so the tenant in Property One LLC here pays holding company LLC the monthly rent to them. Where, who, where do they pay that rent? So the rent can go. It can have the Property One, Property Two, Property Three. It can have that name on it, mm -hmm. but it's all going to be deposited in the holding company LLC. <laughs> okay. And the reason the bank will do that is the owner... Is the member manager. Yes. Yeah, gotcha. Yes. Okay. All right. And and I and I totally understand. I know a lot of people are just their minds are like, whoa. Yeah, and so at, at the end of this, we're gonna have Cindy's information. Um, but this is, I mean, again, if you're if you even if you have rental properties um, or you're thinking about getting rental properties, you have clients, these are the things that they need to need or you need to consider. And then one of the new um, new phrases out that it has been around for the last couple of years is cost segregations. And it can save you a ton of money on your taxes in the year you buy the property. But I do want you to hire a professional. It's not a DIYer. No. Get a professional to do that. And it's a couple grand. It is. And you can deduct their fee. Um, what it does is in a residential, we take the purchase of the property over 27 and a half years. If it's commercial, it's over 39. So what that's going to do is break down that property so I can take more in the year I purchased instead of having to take it over 27 and a half years. Or example, if I put a new roof on, I might have to take that over 15 years, right? Well, if you spend 10 grand, 10 grand over 15 years isn't very much, it doesn't do anything for my tax return, right? This really helps you get a, a boost in your tax return and really helps you maximize your deductions. Yeah, and it's, it's very popular right now. So for example, a single family resident at 567,000 is the purchase price. The normal depreciation would be 16,000 a year. Once the assets are moved to a shorter depreciable, depreciable life, it's 148000 So we're going to write off about 32000 of your taxes on that kind of a property. So I will tell you, if you're my client, I'm going to say you need to do a cost segregation. And it has to be, you have to get it the year you buy the property. Well, so, yes. But I'm going to also say that might be, I might be wrong on that. Only because I had a client... They and I'm asking for a friend because yes. <laughs> I got a couple <laughs> properties I need to do this on. So I have a client that just brought me a cost segregation, and they brought their property in 21, and I haven't yet looked at it. But I don't know that that's accurate, and I don't know the answer, okay. so I need to find that out. Okay, so cost segregation works on long-term properties. And yes, it still happens. I still have clients that buy a property, do a cost segregation, and the next year they're like, gosh, I had a great deal, so I sold it. Well, you just recapture all of that depreciation. So the, and ha p clients say, well, Cindy, do magic. Okay, it's not magic. Like, <laughs> it just is. You yep. put the right things in place, 
And then unfortunately, you sold it. So now all that magic you thought I did, I have to bring back. Yep. Yeah. All right. And I think, uh, yeah. And then, of course, I want to, going back to te- uh, cost segregation analysis, I, it, it is a, because uh, I, I do, you know, we do a lot, of, a lot of teaching and a lot of classes for our agents on, on real estate wealth management. Mm-hmm. And, and we find that, you know, the, the cost segregation analysis is very few agents that we come across exactly. know what it is. Because uh, it's it's something that is for whatever reason is not mm-hmm. really ever talked about in our industry, or whatever the case is, Should and be. and I just would implore and recommend every single agent if you're working with investors, uh, do, get knee deep into them and understand them because you are going to bring some tremendous value. And now that I've told you, and if you don't do it, you're <laughs> failing in you. your fiduciary responsibilities to your clients. <laughs> so so oh, okay. yeah, we got to go. Yeah, that's okay. okay. So then let's get into 1031 tax exchanges real quick. So, so let's say we had, we sold that property. I did a cost segregation on it. And now I have to recapture everything. If I 1031 it, I can defer those capital gains. Yeah. yeah. And that's another great way. And yes, you need a professional, but also you need to know the rules of the 1031. I had a client come in. They did a 1031. It, they did it on a short-term rental, and those you cannot do a 1031 on. I mean, there is nowhere even on this tax return to put that it was short. Yeah. So don't do it on short-term rentals. All right. Um, so I want to end um, with a story. And this is just, you know... Uh, for for our team, we have a, we have an incredible estate attorney, and obviously you're our incredible tax strategist. And we've somehow been able to bring everybody together and have our conversation, have our clients working with everybody on our team. And so we we had a client, we have a client, and we've been telling them, uh, you know, they they want to buy a new home, keep your home, keep your home, keep your home, and they're just they're so caught up in negative cash flow, and which a lot of investors are. Oh well, I don't want to buy this house because I'm going to be out of pocket two hundred bucks a month and and so forth. And we have that discussion. Okay, so you put two hundred dollars into your your four hundred one k. How much of a return you're going to get if I put two hundred dollars into a Four hundred fifty thousand dollar house that's going to appreciate over five percent, but it was really interesting. So they were actually in a situation where if they were going to uh, hold on to their house, they're going to be out of pocket a thousand a month. Okay, negative cash flow a thousand a month. Okay, for most investors, just DOA dead on arrival. So we we mm-hmm. picked you up. We picked you up. We didn't pick you up. We p- <laughs> picked up the phone and called you, and because because you are this investor's um, uh, accountant as well, and said okay. If we're in this situation, we're going to be negative $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year. You know the finances in the accounting situation of our client. Is it a possible or is it a positive thing because they have, a, they have enough room to, mm-hmm. to absorb yes. the $12,000 a year for write-offs? And because we all work together, you knew yes. the answer. And so now all of a sudden, yeah, they're out of pocket $1,000 a month. But at the end of the year, mm-hmm. it's a write-off. And now they get to hang on to their house and let it appreciate more. Right, right, yes. So look at everything as a year-end decision, not necessarily as the one that's right in front of you. That's going to contribute positively or negatively to that year-end. But that's the benefit of having you to have that conversation. Correct. With. Thank you. Yes. All right, so um, we've got your phone number. We've got your email up here. What is the process? I reach out to your office. Walk me through the process. So um, one of my employees, one of my staff, one of my team members, they email you my pricing and how we work. Um, We work on a monthly contract, and if I'm going to do your back year, you're going to owe for the back year, but we're going to get you on the monthly contract for that next year, and I want to hear from you, and I'll tell you. I want to hear when your income's changed by twenty five grand, even if it's just 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 a quick email. Um, I'm big on planning. If you just have a quick question, email me. I don't. I do not limit emails. I want to hear from you. I want to know what's going on. I don't want to see on Facebook that you had a child and then you moved and bought a house. Like that's all great, but the fact that I'm trying to remember it and you're not, you know, especially when people have a baby January of twenty three, they forget that baby's a year old. Like. We're into the next tax season. I'm like, I think we are missing the kids on here. So I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you as much as possible just so that I know that we're right where we need to be. 
if everything has stayed the same, I don't need to hear from you, right? But the key is, is get in with me, talk to me. I want to know what's going on. Yeah. And I would say when, when we first started with you, I, I wasn't, I was, <clears throat> the monthly retainers, what I like to refer to, was a little bit different. I'm used to just paying for my filing at the end of the year. But man, I, it is the best, it's the best thing out there because now I feel like I can, you know I can reach out to you every, yeah. Yeah, and yes. I can reach out yeah. to you when mm-hmm. I have questions because it's yes. often that you get that call from me and say, okay, this is mm-hmm. what I'm thinking about doing mm-hmm. and what are your thoughts? So, uh, so Cindy, thank you so much. I know you have family in town, so I appreciate you um, pulling you away bet. to spend a little bit of time with us. There's our information on the screen. Leave you with the quote of the day. The strongest principle of growth lies in the human choice. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Go out and sell a home. <laughs>